So, welcome to the Urban Center, and thank you for coming out tonight. Um, for, I was informed just um, a few minutes ago by Greg Weston, uh, Executive Director of Exhibitions of the League, uh, that this is, in fact, the last lecture at the Urban Center in 29 years. And we are, they have uh, moved, if you don't know, they, they moved down to 594. Broadway downtown, and um, are currently uh, initiating a process of becoming nomadic. So, all the <laughs> events and exhibits in different parts of the city. This exhibition toward the center of the city, to a certain extent, um, uh, initiates that process, right? Um, so, uh, while there is a series of projects and diagrams, images, and objects, the next room that you can look at. Um, to a large part, the exhibit itself is distributed throughout the city. Tonight, we have um, the pleasure to uh, introduce to you uh, the Living Architecture Lab and the Environmental Health Clinic, who have kind of taken on the challenge to literally insert into the city two, not just one, but two uh, interventions, um, which you learn a little bit more about tonight. Um, uh, I'm pleased to be able to, to welcome David Benjamin and Sian Yang from the Living Architecture Lab at Columbia University, Natalie Jarvajenko from NYU's Environmental Health Clinic, who uh, will tonight present a multi-perspectival view on this project, Amphibious Architecture, which they have collaborated with. Um, many people are involved, and I won't name them, and we'll let them just in brevity, I'm not speaking too much myself, but then credit where credit is due. I will just acknowledge uh, the generous support of the J. Clausen Mills Fund of the Architecture League, which made possible the five commissions for the exhibit, which you're able to see, um, as well as the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts, which has generously supported the exhibition in the other room, and the Department of Architecture and the Department of Media Study at the University of Buffalo, uh, who have supported the media program. Um, in addition, uh, Rosalie Ginevra, who is not here, the Executive Director of the Architectural League, staunch, staunch supporter of the project uh, uh, from its inception to through its um, instantiation here in the gallery as well as in the city, as well as Greg Westner, who is sitting very kind of, um, uh, should we say, to modestly in the back, uh, and kind of grinning uh, about his patient and persistent uh, efforts, this uh, exhibit probably would not have happened. Um, and as well, the extremely dedicated and uh, committed staff of the architectural league. Um, if you have a chance afterwards with a glass of wine, uh, introduce yourself to them and say hello. Uh, they're, they're incredible people. Anyway, without much further ado, I'm going to turn this over to David, right? He's going to start. Uh, okay, uh, we are going to uh, have a kind of multi-part uh, presentation here. Uh, first, I want to very quickly um, just thank uh, Mark Shepard, who's been an incredible supporter of our uh, version of uh, Sentient City here. Um, also, the Architectural League has been an incredible supporter of this project, but also of uh, the, the architecture practice that Sue and I have um, in many different ways. We feel incredibly lucky to have an organization like this in the city, and particularly we want to uh, thank Rosalie Ginevro, Fred Wessner, and, and Rieselbach for their, their great support. Um, so I quickly want to describe uh, how we think this is going to work tonight. Um, this is basically a project, Amphibious Architecture, that involves, uh, in some ways, of looking at it, many different uh, collaborations, or uh, maybe put it differently, many different mashups. Um, in one sense, uh, as the word amphibious suggests, it's a collaboration between land and water. It's also a collaboration between humans and fish, a collaboration between uh, nonprofit organizations, such as the Architectural League, but also the Bronx River Arts Center. Um, so nonprofit organizations and city organizations, particularly the EDC, the New York City Economic Development Corporation, 
as well as uh, collaboration with industry. Shop Architects has been very involved in support of Silver Spring Marine, Arab Engineers, um, and also a collaboration with uh, universities and research, so Columbia University of New York and others. Um, and also, it's uh, in many ways a collaboration between architecture and art. And finally, it's a collaboration between the Living Architecture Lab, which Sun and I are co directors of, and the Environmental Health Clinic, which now is the director of. Um, so, in that spirit of all of these different kind of collaborations and combinations, we thought it would be fitting to tell basically uh, two versions of the same story. Um, so, story number one. Uh, this is a project that had uh, uh, roots in uh, work that uh, we had done as the living, which you see a couple of images up at the top, and which Natalie had done um, as X design. So, so that's one way of, the, of positioning the combination here. Um, and more specifically, we'll just describe a little bit of the precedent work um, that we've done as the Living and the Living Architecture Lab that kind of fed in in different related groups of research to this project here. Um, so this is one of our previous projects, uh, titled River Glow, um, which are basically a series of floating ponds um, that flow in um, the East River and sense uh, environment quality um, this time, uh, specifically pH level and um, display the reading back to the shore to the people. So that one obviously related to what we're proposing here, but also um, a related project that we did uh, in support of the Van Allen Institute was called uh, Living City. And in this project, we were thinking about different forms of mobile communication. Again, like all of this exhibit toward the Senate City, it's in the spirit of ubiquitous uh, computing. And in this uh, project, we were imagining kind of a platform for buildings to talk to one another. And the premise here is that buildings, architecture already has a variety of different sensors, um, sensors for things like temperature, light, energy use. Um, but one thing that we noted is that um, for the most part, as sophisticated as a single building gets in its sensing, it remains in the realm of local and good and local. So Living City was an experiment in connecting uh, one building with local in input and local output to first just another single building, um, but then by extension um, to many other buildings in the city in a kind of network that can grow. And in this project, we were kind of experimenting with the idea of uh, buildings as living things that can communicate with one another, that can build their own social networks. That can participate in this uh, realm of ubiquitous computation. Um, um, after Living City, um, uh, related to the idea of the building being able to communicate with um, other buildings or uh, potentially with human beings, um, this is a commission project uh, in a, a permanent uh, pavilion installation in Seoul, Korea, um, commissioned by the uh, city city government, um, which measures. Um, changing air quality of the city in real time, um, signals it back, and also that measures um, interest, people's interest in um, air quality through text messaging. So basically you can text message and require or in inquire um, the current reading of air quality to the pavilion. Um, the pavilion first will show and share with other citizens that there is somebody out there who is interested in, in the reading of air quality right now. And it, uh, sends a reply text message back um, to give you the information. Um, so we're showing these, these projects, and here's the last precedent project, um, not just to show previous work, but to show the kind of line of thinking that, that for us, no project exists in a vacuum. It's connected to other uh, lines of investigation, both by us and by others. And uh, we want to show here a little bit about the Living Architecture Lab, which is um, a, a kind of research initiative that Soon and I are involved with uh, at Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. It involves some of our own projects, so you'll recognize up here you know, these images which we discussed before. Um, but it also involves work with our students in a class that, that we teach called Living Architecture. And that's been a way for us to engage some of the things we've been thinking about uh, with the research interests and expertise of other uh, students at the university, 
and other projects have grown out of that uh, class and out of the lab to take on a life of their own, including this project called the Revolution Door. Um, so with that as the kind of background, that is the kind of mix of things um, that, that we had in mind coming into this project, uh, we came together with Natalie and proposed to put ubiquitous computing for this exhibit, this sentient city exhibit, uh, in some places where it doesn't usually go. So we propose, first of all, to um, to float ubiquitous computing in the water um, and to engage these kind of uh, mutually dependent and interrelated ecosystems of land and water. Um, and specifically for the project, what it does is it's a series of floating cubes um, in water um, that sends dissolved oxygen level as an uh, environmental reading of, of the water body and also that follows um, or senses the presence of fish and displays um, its trajectory when it comes into, into the network to the people on the shore. It also has a text message interface um, that allows people to communicate um, with uh, fish or um, the quality of water. Um, so, so that's kind of what we're describing here is just the the vision that we had when we came together to write a proposal for the for this uh, exhibit, and these were the kind of things that we were thinking about, a kind of rendering of what this thing might look like, a kind of cartoon of how this interaction might go, um, some sense as soon as said of what would be the input and output, um, and more specifically, we imagined that we could make this thing work through what we consider a kind of amphibious input and this output. So in other words, the, uh, the input is half in the land, half in the water, um, or more accurately, half in the water, half in the air. Um, so we have input of different conditions of the water quality, which are uh, the, the water quality and the presence of marine life, and we have conditions on land, which are uh, human in, in the environment, in the system. Um, and the output also uh, is related to both underwater and above water. It's basically a series of lighting elements, and those uh, are triggered responsibly by interaction with the system, and they uh, illuminate both the air and by, by extension the sea, but also the water and underwater. Um, here you see one specific type of interaction where, um, where you'll be able to uh, uh, send a text message um, to request uh, data about air quality and also about the presence of fish, and you get a you get a response back um, with those data. But more so, um, it's an it's an open experiment where you'll be able to um, get also at the same time gather those data to um, make it available to the public and to share it with the public. Um, okay, so so that was kind of what we were thinking as we um, proposed the project. Um, then it came time to actually make it work, and we started engaging a level of complexity that we had not um, dealt with directly before. Um, so we were working with um, two different networks, um, as we described before, one in the Bronx, uh, one in the East River, and we were also working in conditions that we hadn't worked in before, which is the river. Um, everyone we talked to who we uh, told about the idea, including engineers, um, people who owned peers, people who were very water-related. Um, uh, everyone we talked to said, have you ever done something in the East River before? Do you know what you're up against? And we said, uh, we've heard, we've heard, we've heard what it's like. Um, so we really had to um, engage a level of prototyping that we hadn't dealt with before. Uh, it involved a huge team, and many of those people were listed at the, at the beginning of the presentation, um, a level of coordination and complexity, um, that was uh, a big challenge, but also very exciting. Um, and, and a kind of uh, uh, time frame and uh, budget that was, um, it was exciting to work with, although it also challenging to work with. Um, so I want to just give a sense here of what our lab is like, and then we're going to um, have a couple of people um, who worked on the project, uh, Kevin and Deborah also, explain a little bit about what they, uh, what they did in the various pieces. So 
you see there a sense of the, the different components coming together, the different people involved. Um, one of the ways that we were able to uh, investigate the project in a kind of short time frame is have different team leads who are in charge of different things like the input component, the sensors, and the output component. Um, and it involved a lot of back and forth communication. So with that, I'd like to invite up uh, Kevin and Deborah. Um, Kevin Way, uh, graduate of Columbia, former uh, student in the Living Architecture class, but has done a, a, a second degree in, in this kind of stuff uh, at Columbia, and was, was involved with the project almost from the start. And Deborah Richards graduated just this past year, has also been involved all summer uh, helping to work on various components. And they are going to describe the, the various parts that they work on. Um, so, my name is Kevin, and um, I thought I'd take this opportunity to uh, share with you some, uh, some internal, some in house documents that uh, we passed around. They're very helpful for us to a little bit around the time to find them. Um, you've heard David and Susan talk about um, input. outputs and two points of processing. Um, the three inputs would be the users who are enabled with a cell phone or other mobile device that has SMS on it. Um, sorry, the, the inputs are the users of SMS and the fish in the river and the pole made of the water. And then the outputs would be uh, the light that gets displayed, um, the reply back that you get on your, um, on your cell phone. Um, and also, of course, the, the data that we collect um, throughout this whole time. Um, more, more specifically, uh, I can just take you through how, how one might uh, interact with this project. You noticed uh, the very first slide, um, two keywords, East River and Bronx River, send them to the uh, number 41411. And uh, this is what would happen to you, uh, the user, your cell phone. Um, we routed through a web service called TextMark. Um, that would go to our VOH, our back of house, where we host a lot of um, code that we've written to make the project work. And that goes back down locally, back down to the site, right next to the shore, um, what we call our in-out control. And um, when you do that, the, the light display blinks. And then from the, re the reverse point of view, uh, when a fish swims by, that's picked up by our sonar sensor, it's routed through our central control, goes back to back the house, back to the text marks, and then through back to you again on your phone. Can you please speak louder? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> Um, right, so, so that's the fish, if you heard me. <laughs> um, the water quality is picked up by an assault oxygen sensor, and it falls in the path. The blue, the back of the house, the text marks, and then you get it back on your phone. And then, of course, we, um, we collect all this information that we're gathering, and we put it um, on this other web service called Patch Bay. Um, and yeah, that's basically how it works. Um, this other internal document that we have, it's, uh, it's essentially the same thing, more complex, because it goes over the, uh, the individual hardware that's involved. Um, we have our two sensors down here, the sonar sensors, and the dissolved oxygen. Um, we have our SMS that's over here, other input. And our output is down here with the lights, and our processing is all in here in the center. Now, it's a little like complex, and people have passed this diagram all around. There's like a cup stain and some other notes on here, but um, I think it's really interesting to see the sort of project. Um, we used we used a Mac Mini as like the central brain of the project. Um, we wrote our code in an open source environment called Processing. Maybe some of you've heard of it. Um, we got a lot of help from um, all the resources that are online and the libraries that other people have written. Um, the, the sensors have a master control. That's a, a, an Arduino microcontroller, and they have their own. And the same thing with the light display. We have a master and all the people, or all the individual tubes, um, 1 through uh, 16. Um, here's your sort of close up look of what, uh, what's inside all the tubes, um, all the buoys. And also, I want to talk about some of the more specific things that we did. Um, we used this protocol called UDP, Universal Datagram, Datagram Protocol. Um, we packaged all of our information that we were sending, like, like all of these uh, 
all these arrows, all of these back and forth arrows, they're all UDP packets. I found this was a really great way to um, send information over long distances. Uh, we found it to be very robust and um, easy, easy for everyone to understand, both um, both machines and people. Um, the sort of protocol that we used for um, electrical signaling was called RS-45. And yes, yes, that's good. Um, this is an actual box that sits on the shore and uh, controls the light display. Um, I'll just show you this one because, I mean, it's, it's really all there is to it. Hi, Deborah. I'm going to take a closer look at um, some of the uh, programs that we used and some of the robustness that was and measures taken towards creating the actual um, installation. So this is um, the processing code that we used that was on the Mac Mini. And, um, this is uh, the display window, and it shows how the, our code is um, generating uh, the light display and changes in the light display through sensor data coming in. And um, so what you can see here are the two lights on each of the tubes, and in this moment you see a fish passing by, and this was just to help us build the actual program. Uh, it helps us troubleshoot it uh, later on in the process. Um, so from that processing code on the shore, um, it's sent to all the Arduinos out in the water. And an Arduino is a microprocessor that is also open source, and um, it's an open source electronics platform, so all the hardware is open source, and the environment is open source. So these are what actually control the light movements, and each one of these is placed inside the tube, and then it's all here, we're just testing it in the lab. Um, finally, here you see a close-up of the tube sitting in the water. So, as far as interaction between the people and the tubes, um, the top light is as default on, and it sort of tracks the movement of the water. So you can see it swaying back and forth in the water. Um, the bottom light goes on when um, a fish swims underneath the display. And um, so this is, and then the whole uh, light color changes based on water quality. So if the water quality is better right now than the average yesterday, then the lights will be blue. And if it's water quality is worse than the average uh, yesterday, then the light color will fade to red. Um, and so this is sort of a relative way of um, seeing data. But you can also get very specific data by text messaging. And when you do text message, the top light blinks showing um, public interest um, and then finally, there was a ton of prototyping that went into creating the final results. So this is actually at the uh, fabricator's um, factory up in Brooklyn, and we worked with um, McDermott Lighting Corporation, and they specialize in marine-grade lights. Um, so the lights are both very robust in water, and also they were able to guarantee a two-mile visibility. Um, there was many back and forth communications with them, and some of the issues that we had to figure out that we hadn't um, foreseen were the actual layout of the LEDs on the photo boards, and um, also the, uh, the uh, energy consumption of each actual uh, tube to make sure that the last light was just as bright as the first light. And then, oh, and then, oh. And then, so here we see again the final production of the um, of the tubes at, um, at the fabricator's uh, warehouse. And um, there were many measures that had to be taken into account, such as the we used um, Lexon, which is a very robust uh, plastic material for the tubes, and it doesn't crack, it doesn't fade due to the sun. Um, and then also the bottom of the tubes were um, watertight and the top had a screw on top so that the entire core could be pulled out and that any changes um, after the installation happened could be made if necessary. So I think that's about it for the... Uh... Um, and one of the things that we had to, one of the things that we had to figure out after um, all the electronic um, part 
is to actually put this in water and make sure that um, it's not damaged and it just um, doesn't run away. Um, this is something that we didn't anticipate um, in the beginning, but it actually became a, a pretty big problem or a big issue. Um, so here, basically, our basic strategy was to put the 16 um, tubes in a grid right here, about 70 feet from the shore and from this pier, um, and have two boat anchors um, going out about 150 feet um, in a cross uh, X way to these two points to hold them down. Um, and to also connect um, the whole grid back to two, uh, two columns that are underneath the pier. Here you see um, two uh, what we call strong bags that are 12-inch um, diameter PVC tubes that are filled with um, light, very light expandable foam to make the whole thing float. And there is a, um, a strong rope uh, net that runs between the two um, backbones to support or to hold the tubes in place in the middle. Um, and here you see a sectional view of the installation where this is a pier, pier 35. Um, these two uh, pipes here are the uh, kind of the perimeter uh, of the network, and the and the tubes are actually floating in the middle, um, kind of just barely attaching to the to the net of rope that's um, actually installed between these two uh, floating uh, strong bags. And here um, uh, you see the process of installation actually, um, where there are a lot of um, there are, there are a lot of volunteers um, that helped us um, actually install the project. And here you see each volunteer holding one tube because the tubes are already connected together with electrical wiring, um, moving and moving the moving the tube towards the shore. Um, here you see people actually. Um, putting the strong bags, which are about 300 pounds each, um, over the shore, over the fence, into the water, and um, um, step by step, putting each row of tubes um, into the water. Um, here you see the uh, on-site testing of the tubes and the, and the lighting and how or if the text message works on-site. So this is in our, in our van. And this is the building that's on the on the pier um, right next to where the installation actually is, um, where um, it's a department sanitation building. And they're uh, kind enough to um, let us host the box or the main controller um, inside their building. And so, kind of wrapping up our version of the story, um, we see this as a kind of open-ended experiment. It's a prototype, even though it's a, an installation here. Um, we really like the idea that it has real-time interaction through text messaging. Um, and that the text messaging, as, as we've described in several different ways now, causes the lights to blink as you see this happening now. And that allows other people to see that someone is interested in the system. Um, another thing that was important to us was to kind of challenge the regular do not disturb approach to the waterfront. Um, instead of that, we proposed uh, engaging the water with curiosity, with engagement, with experimentation. Also, we wanted to challenge this idea that the water is just a mirror to reflect our own image, our own architecture, and our own city. Um, instead, we wanted to encourage us to look at water as a kind of dynamic threshold. Um, uh, we, we definitely um, look at, the, at this as a water ecosystem project, and I think now we'll describe more about that. Um, but we also want to just mention and kind of close by describing how we think this is an architecture project. Um, one, uh, we think that uh, the grid of lights out in the waterfront kind of marks a territory of water that we think could be thought of as public space. So by marking the public space, we, we indicate to the city that this is a shared resource, that this affects us, that this belongs to all of us, the water um, out right, right around us, right where we are in the city both in the East River and the Bronx River. Um, second, we think it's a public project in that the uh, project is this kind of register of, uh, of collective public interest. So when many people text into the system, you see a lot of flashing, and that indicates something common about us, and about our interest, and about our curiosity about the water. And finally, uh, although this may seem a little far-fetched, we feel very excited about thinking about this project as a prototype building facade. So if you imagine from uh, the earlier precedent project we showed of 
of Living Life, which has this kind of pavilion, uh, panels below and the length according to environmental quality and according to interest. Imagine that uh, building facade just turned or rotated 90 degrees. It's on the water. And like our prototype building facades, this project has sensors on one side and the other. So the prototype building facade has sensors on the inside of the building, sensors on the outside of the building. This project has sensors above water, sensors below water. Um, our project, or the, the prototype building facade, um, has a kind of dynamic lighting that's visible um, from far away from the project. Uh, in the building facade, that equals panels of light that illuminate and blink. Uh, in our uh, amphibious architecture project, this is basically a, a series of lights that, that also glow and blink, and in this case, change color to show things about the, the conditions of the environment and the public. Uh, and finally, both projects involve what we think is an exciting new potential using ubiquitous computing for engaging the, uh, the architecture, the building facade, also the waterfront as an extended uh, facade of the city um, uh, through SMS, through text messaging, through mobile communication. Something that's both very personal because it's the, it's the device you carry around in your pocket that you get all kinds of personal information on. Um, but it also can be turned into something very public when we combine um, our interests, our combined text messages, and in interface uh, like this. So that's our version of the story. We very much like uh, moving Rush along. We will now have uh, a completely different but related version of the exact same facts. <laughs>
prescient question of this exhibition. What is the opportunity for change that these new technologies provide? And um, that's the framework in which I'd like to continue to introduce some of the concerns of the clinic and why um, I found myself more times than I'd like to count now submerged in the East River. Um, but before I was submerged in it, I spent quite a bit of time on top of it, um, which is one of the places where um, I held uh, office hours with the environmental health clinic. People who come to the clinic, uh, just like people who come to the familiar institution of the, uh, of the health clinic, um, uh, you know, bring up their own appointment. Uh, but uh, instead of being called patients, they're called inpatients, because uh, they're too impatient to wait for legislative change to address environmental health issues. Um, and so an inpatient concerned about water quality might meet here on the East River, which is actually an immersive context in which to understand the material conditions uh, that affect our own health. Here's another uh, um, uh, field office for the Environmental Health Clinic that I want to show uh, precisely because uh, the holding office hours in the middle of a roundabout is really about using the roundabout as an icon of um, headless social movement by right? reinventing these um, these urban spaces, reimagining how we use them. But using this particular type of uh, decision making and interaction is very different from the top down red line control, right, that we, we uh, understand at most intersections. In this case, you have many people making micro decisions in situ for their own benefits and their own safety, not delegating to some distant authority, and you get greater through throughput and fewer accidents in uh, coordinated social movement. This. So this icon of headless social movement, I want you to keep in mind. I'm going to show you a couple of um, things that will lead us up to this question of water quality um, uh, and um, what the clinic does. This is one of the uh, protocols, water quality monitoring protocols that we've developed called the Tadpole Bureaucrat uh, Protocol or Keeping Tabs. In patients who are concerned about water quality, um, and many people are, um, but many people who come to the clinic are, um, have difficulty understanding what actually water quality means. What, what does the 200 years of DPC and DPP mean? Um, and making it meaningful is actually part of the, um, the representational challenge I face. In this case, the type of bureaucrat protocol or keeping tabs. Um, so it's an addition of tap poles, each of which um, is named after a local bureaucrat whose decisions affect water quality, right? Um, so uh, inpatient concern for a sample of water um, might uh, raise their tap pole bureaucrat um, in a uh, companion animal device. Precisely because the tap poles are exquisite biosensors, right? Exquisitely sensitive to the whole class of industrial contaminants we call endocrine disruptors that are in fact um, uh, implicated in the breast cancer epidemic, the, uh, the uh, uh, obesity epidemic, a two and a half year drop in the average age of onset of young um, men and young women. Um, these ubiquitous uh, health issues um, that actually are mediated by this, uh, in, in tadpoles um, by the same T3 uh, mediated processes, the same hormones uh, that we kind of dry our own adolescents, the uh, tadpoles experience. But they actually, of course, go through it with them um, uh, at much higher relative body mass levels or concentrations, and their developmental events are much more observable. So you can count how many legs they grow, for instance. But to uh, do those observations requires close interaction and ongoing um, uh, observation. So these are companion animal devices. This is a tadpole walker which um, takes the tadpole out for a walk in the evening, right? Um, and what gets set up there is important for this, um, for this project is uh, when you take a tadpole out walking in the evening, as dolphins and these images can testify, people, people will ask you, what are you doing? What the hell are you doing, right? Walking in a tadpole. And then uh, you'll have to explain who the tadpole is named after. Right, your local EPA officer or a DC officer or somebody that they probably don't know the name of either. And 
Then the next time they see you, they'll ask you, how's your tap water going? Because they're probably concerned for the same water quality and the same water sample. Um, and they, um, what they're doing, or what we're doing in, in designing that kind of interface is creating a collective sense-making context, right? A performance in which uh, many of us are trying to make sense of these complex socio-ecological systems that are very hard to make any definitive statement about, let alone to inform action. So I want to show um, one prescription out of the clinic before uh, we go on because it relates immediately to um, water quality and what it is we can do about it. Because the clinical context is really a very good one for uh, organizing or coordinating actions, lifestyle experiments, things you can do to improve local environmental health. Um, and this is one of the prescriptions uh, that immediately affects the water quality, or that could immediately affect the water quality in this river. This is a no park. Um, prescription which takes no parking spaces like those associated with fire hydrants and prescribes the removal of the asphalt um, to, uh, to create an engineered micro landscape that can infiltrate roadborne pollution. And I want to actually, but it's, at the moment, is talking about the kind of real crisis that we face now where our traditional strategies of addressing environmental uh, issues has been to kind of identify big polluters and sue them, right? So that's why we've got dredging going on the Hudson River where GE is finding out for 30 years um, cleaning up the mess they made, right? Um, now, the biggest pollution burden on the New York, New Jersey estuary system is that, that uh, hydrocarbon, that oily hydrocarbon waste, the cadmium neurotoxicants, the, um, from the impervious surfaces that we the passive network of impervious surfaces for roads and sidewalks, which of course is um, uh, something we all contribute to and all use. Right? So this is now the major pollution burden, and it defines the traditional ways of addressing how we can uh, understand or intercept, uh, or we can't, who do we suit? Every one of us, right? Um, so this, uh, what this um, prescription does is create a small, um, small insertion that, of course, uh, intercepts the broken pollution, rehydrates the entire block, and allows for um, a uh, water quality, distinct water quality improvement. Just one little rule of thumb here: um, there's about um, there's about uh, two to three uh, uh, um, fire hydrants on every city block. Right? If we converted each one of those to a no park, where they can continue to operate as you know emergency vehicle parking, right? Uh, fire hydrants can come park there. So what? They'll flatten a few plants. They'll regenerate. It's okay, right? Um, it doesn't interfere with the emergency vehicle uh, traditional context, but it allows. Um, it allows us to redefine the emergency into you know, when they're not being used by fire trucks. They're servicing the environmental health emergency, right? They're intercepting roadblock pollution, they're also capturing uh, particular matter, they're uh, removing the impervious surface of our imagination of where and how we might use vegetation in the city. So um, this is um, one um, exception uh, of what we can do to improve water quality. But who does it? Who has that information? Who feels licensed to take actions to improve local environmental health? I think is the question that we face. I want to introduce you to um, another kind of institutional twist um, called uh, the Bronx Ooze, which I recently launched, which um, is a set of interfaces that take on um, this problem of um, that this problem that we are not alone, right? That there actually are other organisms that we share our natural uh, uh, systems, natural resources with, and particularly surprising to many of us who live in urban contexts where we start hearing about a whale in the Lattice Canal, coyote in Central Park, elk in Westchester County, three types of seals that have set up their home. I do know in the East River, right? A um, uh, these these Animals are moving in to our urban habitat. Why the hell are they doing that? Why are they doing that now? Now more than ever before. Why do we suddenly have more, actually, um, more species, probably more species of fish in the East River? Um, because we've had probably 100 non-natives move in. We probably haven't had 100 extinctions. 
Um, why do we have more animals now here? Um, I'm going to um, give you a couple of theories. The, um, one, the most important one is that in redesigning our, um, well, of course, there's habitat loss. This, the other one is that in redesigning our urban spaces and Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act, uh, we've actually made them a little bit more habitable, not only for humans, but for non-humans, right? And every green space that we create is an invitation for non-humans to cohabit with us, right? Um, so as we improve our environmental health, we're actually inviting more cohabitation with non-humans. And uh, what do we do about that? I'd like to actually introduce one more interface before I um, contextualize the, um, the uh, fish interface, and that's with a um, the um, much reviled uh, pigeon. This is an interface that I think presents the argument that I'm, uh, I'm trying to make. These are just communication technologies for birds that um, when birds land on them, they uh, provide a perch in the brutalist uh, modern architecture here, in this case, in the sculpture court, that um, translates uh, bird concerns into human dialect. So as we We've got a few communication technologies. This is an attempt to give them some uh, communication technologies. When the birds land on these, these uh, triggers, they say something like this. And here's what you need to do. You go down there and buy some of those health food bars, the ones you call bird food, and bring it here and scatter it around. There's a good person. <laughs> Okay, so there's actually six different arguments that are around the, um, the uh, sculpture court in this case. Each perch had a different argument on it. And the birds actually decided that this particular, that there was one uh, of the perches that was uh, about, it was triggered many, many, many more times than any of the other perches. So the birds decided that this was the most persuasive argument. Tick, tick, tick. That's the sound of genetic mutations of the avian flu becoming a deadly human flu. Do you know what slows it down? Healthy subpopulations of birds, increasing biodiversity generally. It is in your interests that I am healthy, happy, well-fed. Hence, you could share some of your nutritional resources instead of monopolizing them. That is, share your lunch. <laughs> okay, so that is a claim that in fact, again, our health and the emerging pandemics that are the largest health threat we face are a concern that we uh, share with non-humans. Um, and and it's, it's in that um, vein that I want to introduce the, um, to my history with this particular interface, um, which again comes from this organism-centric point of view, that we can learn a lot from the organisms we cohabit with, um, and they have much information to share with us, that perhaps these emerging ubiquitous computation technologies give us an opportunity to re-script those interactions so that they are more productive. Um, so um, my version of this, as, as David mentioned, um, actually began with the advent of sonar sensors, um, cheap off-the-shelf sonar sensors, which seemed to me were a great opportunity to, um, to re-script reimagine our relationship to natural systems in this context. Um, now, the thing that I want to point out in relation to what Deb and Kevin were, were so emphasizing, that um, the sensors in this array are these off-the-shelf fish sensors, right? And they are not open source. And that means that as a technology, even though they're cheap, they're ubiquitous, you can buy them now for you know, 50 to $70, they're very hard to make sense of them, right? You can't actually draw a lot of resources on the web to figure out what's going on and what's going wrong, or to compare it to other. It's the entire world of marine electronics has been um, built in a, in a closed source realm. So it was really interesting in designing and uh, working with a great team of, um, you know, there was 10 of us all together working on this project. Xenon is also here, uh, uh, who did a lot of work on it uh, for the last year. Um, and um, 
it became very different when we hit the senses, when we hit the uh, traditional uh, proprietary design um, senses where um, they wouldn't share, or it couldn't be shared. We have a great deal of difficulty. So maybe we'll come back to that issue of the value of open information, who can make sense of it, who has is licensed to make sense of it, and whose interests are being served by um, the way information is being controlled. Um, so I wanted to say a couple of things about this, about this uh, interface um, that Um, and 
so what we've obviously initiated with this project is an opportunity to schmooze, to interact with the animals. The signage that we have up on the site is really for business cards for each of the many of the organisms that are, um, we expect to find in the site with their contact details. So if you want to actually pull out your phones and rehearse how to use this interface, I think it's um, uh, you, can, you can get the demo built by Russian. So as Kevin said, the number, the critical number is 41411, but once it's in once, you've got it. Um, and try, um, try your river, because this Bronx River array is set in a uh, place where um, actually the first beaver in over 200 years to have built a lodge in New York City has set up his um, home. And your beaver? Your, sorry, I should say your beaver one word. These keywords in the text marks um, system um, require you, uh, they're, they're just one word in this case. So that's the biggest trick in the system. Uh, our biggest uh, part is teaching people that they don't put space in the beaver. So, anyone got a response from the beaver? You were typing the keyword "yo beaver." Can you see that? It's still single. Oh, you still single. Yeah, because well, they're still single. Okay. <laughs> well, thank goodness we know that. Um, let me introduce you to a couple of the other uh, interesting uh, cohabitants. You can see here, actually, the beaver was named after Jose Serrano, who was the uh, representative um, uh, in honor of his work to clean up the Bronx uh, River. So we've continued that tradition. Um, all the organisms and their business cards are named after local activists and scientists who um, have done work to understand. And um, we think you actually, well, this is uh, Kathy Jones, a winter flounder has been named after Kathy Jones' shop architecture. Which very active um, support of this project. Um, and uh, Kathy Drew, who runs the Hudson River Project, had the blue crab named after her. Paul Manquist has the diamond back terrapin. Uh, he's one of the scientists who really developed a lot of um, understanding. And what's been interesting in spending a lot of time at the East River site is seeing there's about three, certainly at least three, but probably more of these terrapin. When, um, David Stewart showed you that zombie dance of, of putting in the, um, the uh, buoys. We were being watched by two terrapin. Every time I've been down there, there's been one or two or three of these um, uh, terrapin hanging around there. Now, our, our array doesn't, doesn't sense that, but people who are down there are seeing that, oh, look, there's a terrapin there. And then they'll notice that whenever there's blocks around, the terrapin jump up on it. Right? It's terrible for us because these huge big logs come and we think they're going to take out our array. But in fact, um, the terrible mother, because they all jump up on it, and they sit and when there's not, uh, when there's not a, um, a log there, you can see them on the side of the East River, scraping at any little ledge, anything they can get a toehold on. Because like every other amphibious creature, they need to be able to get up on the land all the way around the Manhattan Island, except for a 15-foot stretch just under the, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, there's nothing for them, no sandy beaches, because that's just not on So, um, So getting to know these uh, non-human, uh, maybe I'll tell you just a couple of other stories, and you can explore these through, if you uh, sup scup, I think that's up. The scup, or the, actually the, the vitaling. Uh, the vitaling is interesting. Um, creature that actually moved into the Bronx River and, uh, and established a population in 1933, um, and uh, an Asian immigrant. Um, and they made an interesting deal with the, um, the local freshwater mussels, or the brachyoid mussels. In fact, um, they were able to survive because what they do is they deposit their eggs in an interesting piece of cross-species sexuality. They deposit their eggs on top of the mussels, and the mussels suck them in. Um, then the, the males come along and deposit their sperm on top of the muscles and they uh, suck them in. 
And, uh, and that's how fertilization actually goes on. They kind of, they, the muscles actually midwife or, or nurse the, um, the uh, uh, zygotes of the um, vitamin fish, which has allowed them to survive. Recently, there's, uh, the vitamin almost disappeared. Um, and you'll, you can talk to them about that. They, they, they actually, when you, uh, when you text them, they say, uh, sorry, uh, usually they're a recorded message because they're largely gone because the freshwater mussels are gone. Um, because the nitrogen loading of the, um, in, the, uh, in the river, um, the freshwater mussels have, seem to have disappeared. So what we're actually doing in introducing you to these organisms um, is actually introducing you to the orb chart, if you will, of the East River and the Bronx River. And you can see that in the exhibition over there, where we're starting to sketch out the relationships, the relationships that dictate how it is that um, the uh, mercury, that actually 95% of the mercury in the New York, New Jersey estuary system is from the smoking chimney stacks of coal-fired power plants across the country that sweep across the entire country and deposit in the moist, where the, the, the rainy the precipitation happens in the moist northeast, where it all eventually washes into this mighty um, estuary system that we uh, have it on. So of course the benthic organisms, um, which include uh, the, the juvenile form of the midge here, um, which actually I'm not sure that our Jose, who was named? Anyway, it was Valerie Francis, the, she, got the, she got the mosquito named after she was, I don't think she's anywhere. Anyway, um, there's uh, the benthic organisms that are eaten by the tomcod, that are eaten by the alewife and the striped bass that we eat. So the major source of mercury in the breast milk of American women is, of course, from a fish. Our health and their health is very intimately and viscerally interrelated. And so what do we do about that? Um, I actually showed you that um, I see very much that this uh, interface is um, Spending millions of dollars of dredging in the, uh, the Hudson River 
where the toxic sludge, you know, where are we putting it? Continues to use toxic sludge where we put, where, wherever we put it. Right. So is this a form of interaction in which we can aggregate small interactions to augment nutritional resources to treat or to improve the environmental health of our um, non-human neighbors and, um, and aggregate a kind of collective response in um, using these interactive technologies to accumulate or direct some significant collective action to address our environmental health. So I'm going to finish with one more uh, uh, project to kind of point towards the future of amphibious architecture because uh, I wanted to emphasize that um, that this uh, is a class of projects that's, um, that's reimagining our relationship to natural systems, particularly the aquatic inter uh, interface, um, and taking on the tremendous challenge we face in changing it from a view from a reflective surface into a view of it as a um, as a as a body, as a habitat, teeming with non-human inhabitants inhabitants that uh, this health affects ours. And with, um, um, uh, a project that a research project that I launched last night. Imagine our relationship to um, amphibious, uh, our amphibious researchers, uh, our amphibious resources. So, as you know, the um, uh, the waterfront is being developed from the Hudson River example as um, as a leisure space, and the transportation or the use of water as uh, a mobility is really being um, in the infrastructure choices we're currently making is being downgraded. Um, however, with this new class of FAA airplanes, we have um, been presented another technological opportunity to reimagine mobility. Um, in fact, potentially reusing those water resources that in fact uh, have sighted Manhattan, the mega metropolis of Manhattan here. So last night I launched a, a, a research project that's been um, uh, going for a little while with the amphibious airplane, the Icon, which you see here, and some flight training um, to sort of license, this is the imaginary Air Force that are equipped with the strap-on flight simulator you saw being demonstrated in that video, um, allowing you to imagine who can, who has the license to, to fly, um, or who has the license to reimagine our mobility, who has the license to change our technological choices so that we could in fact move without filling in the wetlands, filling in our estuary systems to provide um, for aeroplanes without um, tarmacking huge swerves of land um, to provide mobility, without the kind of carbon offset um, guilt of mobility, and to reimagine our relationship to natural systems that draws on the collective actions of many, many of us significant environmental effect.